Again, my name is Travis Hall. I'm a, uh, I've been here about 26 years. I've been presenting this demonstration yeah. two or 12 years. Uh, I've got Darren Brown with me today. I don't know what he's <laughs> 10 years. 10 years. Darren's been here 10 years. And thank you guys again for coming out tonight. I know it was a long drive for some of you, but you got a good meal, and hopefully it was worth your time. I really think it is. <laughs> we'll talk to you just a little bit tonight about power lines and power line safety, electricity. Uh, <laughs> And we have constructed here, but so what you can see is, is very similar to what we work on outside. The real power lines. Everything you see here are things that would be on an actual power line. The wire, all these pieces of equipment here, all the hardware, everything is exactly the same that we work on out there. Now I've got a button right here that I push. And when I push this button here just a little bit, we will have 7,200 volts of electricity on this top wire. Which is the same amount of electricity that we work on out here. Now we get, the way we get that 7,200 volts is important and something that you guys need to be aware of. Because underneath here we have a bunch of uh, deep cell batteries, 12 volt deep cell batteries. We run those 12 volt deep cell batteries to an inverter and we invert, convert that to 240 volts of AC power. We run that 240 volts of AC power through this transformer right here. I've got one of the transformer in every house we have on our system is hooked to a transformer. That's what we use to convert the voltage. Now, a transformer is odd because it works two, can work two ways. Well, the way we use a transformer is we put 7,000 volts into it and we get 240 volts out of it to go to your house. Now, what we're doing here tonight, though, is we're putting 240 volts in it and we're getting 7,200 out of it. And the reason that's important is because we have a lot of members out there on this project who have generators. And the majority of them we have, they are hooked up properly. An electrician who knows what he's doing or, or she is doing has hooked them up. They have a transfer switch that when our electricity goes out, that transfer switch opens up and it isolates our lines from their generators. <coughs> but we've got the occasional oddball who has a small generator, and what they've done is they've taken an electrical cord and they put a male end on both sides. Does anybody here want to own up to have one of those? <laughs> Don't raise your hand if you do. <laughs> and then what they do when the electric goes out, they fire their generator up, they plug one plug into, or one end of that into a plug in their house somewhere, and they plug the other end into their generator, and voila, they've got power in about half their house. That's good for your refrigerator and they got cold beer while the electric's out. But the problem is, is they're caught as they are back feeding 7,200 volts onto our power lines. And it's real. I've seen it. Me and um, Dave Guffer, he's standing back there somewhere. We were got called to go help down at um, Harrison County on a storm. We had a couple tree trimmers who were working with us. And they would trim the trees off the power lines that had been torn down. And then Dave and I would put the power lines back up. Well, I sent them on ahead to one, and I said, go ahead, if it's safe to cut the power off, cut the trees off this line, go ahead and do it. Well, they got over there, and when me and Dave pulled up, one of the tree trimmers was yelling at me, it bit me, it bit me. And I thought he was talking about the neighbor's dog or something, or his copperhead. Like, what are you talking about? What's what big? He said, that line, it bit me. Well, that's what happened. Though. The people in that house, they had a little portable generator hooked up, and they had it plugged into their house, and it was back to each other. Luckily, it didn't cause any permanent damage to the guy. But it is a very real thing, and you guys will see that from time to time out there. So just be aware, because just because electricity is off does not mean it's safe to walk up to a power line and grab it. For several reasons, but one of them being that there's a very real possibility that somebody is backfeeding on that line. Now we talked about the electricity here, it's only about 7,200 volts. Now probably somebody here is a cattle farmer, and they're going to say, well, that's nothing. I've got a fence charger out that... It puts out 10,000 volts, so you know, I'm not afraid of your 7,200 volts. A couple of things we need to understand about electricity. When we talk about electricity, we have voltage and we have amps. Most of you know that the amperage is really what we're concerned about. And to, to oversimplify, to give you a very oversimplified definition or an illustration of that, you can picture a voltage as being like a water pipe. It's a water pipe, and the amperage is the amount of water that's pushing through that water pipe. Now, your fence charger probably has 0.001 amps or something on it pushing. It hurts when you get into it, they hurt. We have places out on our project, out on our system, where you could have tens of thousands of amps. So that's really, that's, that's what, what we're concerned with, is the amperage. 
They say it takes about one tenth of an amp to stop a human heart. You get electricity across your heart, one tenth of an amp can kill you. But we're talking tens of thousands out here on the power line. Now we can't develop that kind of current and average here on this, as you'll see here in a little bit, but we can generate quite a bit enough to get the point across. So, okay, we're feeding through this transformer. We're feeding up here 7,000 volts. It will come through this piece of equipment right here. It's an OCR. I'll explain that thing a little bit. It'll come through this thing. It's called a cutout. We'll look at that in a little bit. And it's going to feed to this transformer. <laughs> so, you got to turn it on there. Jerry has all the safety gear on here. So, when I push this button right here, 7,200 volts of electricity on the top line. Here we go. Now, what do you notice? Is there 7,200 volts of electricity on that line? To be honest, I couldn't tell you either. I think there is, because I got my button pushed, but I couldn't guarantee it. You see, the thing about electricity is, even though 26 years in the business, 10 years in the business, there's no way that he or I or anybody else can look at a power line and tell you if there's electricity on that power line. There's no way to know it. That's what makes electricity, one another thing that makes electricity so dangerous. People see a power line laying on the ground, and they say, it's on the ground, it has to be off, right? I don't know. I've seen them laying on the ground hot a lot of times. You ask any of these linemen in the back, they'll tell you the same thing. It can be laying on the ground, still be energized. The only way that we have, it, the only way that we can tell if it's energized or not, is we have testers. All of our trucks have a tester on them. Jerry's going to demonstrate that for you here. Here we go, 7,200 volts. That's the only way that he and I or anybody else can tell you if that line is hot. You guys pull up your car rent, you're walking around the line, you don't know if it's hot. We don't know if it's hot either when we pull up. What we're going to do is we're going to get one of those testers out and we're probably going to test it. And see if it's hot or not. Now, I'm going to hook up this security light right here. So every time now that I have the light, for the button pushed to 7,000 volts, you'll see the light on it. No. Let's talk about a, uh, a ladder. You got huge ladders in your business uh, on a regular basis. I've assumed most of your ladders are made out of fiberglass. There may still be the odd metal ladder out once in a while. Or you may be at somebody's house or something and you don't have your truck with you and somebody has a ladder and they say, hey, here, you can use mine. So, Jared's going to demonstrate what a metal ladder will do when it comes into contact with a 7,200 volts of electricity. That electrical arc right there travels at the speed of light. Anybody know what that is right now? Nobody wants to be the one to raise their hand, right? It's just a, it's just a little less than 700 million miles an hour. And scientists tell us it can be about 35,000 degrees, which is three times hotter than the surface of the sun. That's what an electrical arc is. And so I let the reason when I do this demonstration, I do a lot for children in high schools and elementary schools. And one of the questions they always ask me is, why is it that a bird can sit on a power line and not get hurt? Well, I ask that question. And I get I get cool answers from kids, you know. They got special things on their feet, you know, they got special claws, special skin, special padding, all this stuff. But the answer, obviously, is because they are not touching the ground. Well, electricity is 7,200 volts. It's going back and forth on this top wire at the speed of light, 700,000 million, or 700,000 miles per hour. And it, only, it wants to do one thing. It wants to get to the ground. That's all it wants to do. It's looking for a path to the ground. It doesn't care what that path is. If it's a metal wagon, if it's, if it's me, if it's you. Anything that will conduct electricity that's connected to the ground, this electricity will jump on it. As you can see, when Jerry held that up, he didn't even have to actually touch the power line. He gets close enough to that power line, the electricity will jump through the air and go to the ground. And so when we pull up and we see somebody maybe with a grain auger or a ladder truck or something that's getting close to the line, well, I've heard people say, hey, I'm still a couple feet away from that. It's not going to hurt me, is it? I say, yeah. Yeah, it will. It'll jump right across there. Something else that we run into from time we used to run into. You might still have a TV antenna. I've still got one in my house. I don't like paying for cable. They've still got the old motorized thing on it too there, you know. My wife says, channel 32 is not coming in, so I 
We used to get a lot of calls to cut these down. And we're glad to do that. We are glad to do that. If you see one, if you have one on, somebody has one, we're glad to do that because obviously they're all made out of metal. And it's the same, they are attached to the ground. And it's the same concept here with the metal TV and a can. So do the same thing. Again, 35,000 degrees. The seed of light traveling back and forth. Talk to you about something else real quick here too. I got while well, he's taking chain doing some stuff back there. This is a guy wire, and this guy wire is kind of uh, special because back in probably 20, 20 something years ago, this guy wire was in a man's hand that died. His name was Troy Beachy. He died down in Pekin with his hand on this guy wire. Anybody remember Troy Beacon? He died down there by Billy Tyler's house. Anybody knows where Billy Tyler lived? That was Pekin School Road. He was working for one of our contractors, and they were setting a pole. He didn't have his rubber gloves on. He had a hold of this guy wire. The guy wire came into contact with the power lines. Obviously, a steel guy wire is a very good conductor. So one, from time to time, we see guy wires that have been broken off. People hit it with their mowers, they hit it with a vehicle, and they're just dangling in the wind. They're hanging in the wind. And it creates a fairly dangerous situation. Because obviously they can get up, they can get into power lines. Do that. It's fairly common on a car wreck to see one get broke off and flipped up over a power line. And there's a possibility it could be hanging there and it could still have to have electricity because something's not causing electricity to go out there. <coughs> what about your, uh, your turnout boots? Now we know rubber, they're made out of rubber, obviously. It's a very good conductor. I, I honestly don't know. Do your turnout boots have a steel shank in them? They probably do. <laughs> stuff. So, steel's a very good conductor, obviously. Now, at least we have a pair of old turnout boots here. Now, you probably don't inspect your turnout boots before you put them on to make sure they don't have any holes in them or rips or tears in them, do you? You get the phone call, you just pull them on and you go. Jared's got a pair here. We're going to put a little electricity on them and see what it does. Like a human leg, but they're not just very turnout boots. They have something to definitely step in there. But I want you to understand that those turnout boots don't give you any protection from electricity. You think that because you have your rubber boots on that you are insulated and you can be isolated from the electricity if need be. Definitely not the case. Uh, well, I had a house fire down on the uh, Shores Corner Road back in the summer. I don't know if any of you guys were on that one or not. A big long chicken house right there, down down there. Yeah, some of you guys heard a big fire, and the one thing I remember was being sold and yelling. Did that happen a lot down there? <laughs> no, I did not. So take off. But anyway, there was some triplex going to this big chicken house. And when we got there, the triplex had just burnt down. And it laid down, it fell down on the ground. And it laid on the ground for just a minute. And about every 10 or 15 seconds, it would, it would arc up, and there was a great big arc. We just kept doing this. It's really interesting because people think, hey, that water's on the ground. It has to be off, right? It has to be unsafe. You can go get that out of the way now. Pull our truck in there. Absolutely not. It was laying there hot. And when it got down to the ground and touched something that, that sent it to the ground, it would create a big arc there. So uh, let's talk about trees for a minute because you guys run into this a lot. I'll come out to a car wreck and see a tree or come up to a road shut down a tree is falling across the road and you guys are some of the first responders on the scene. Yeah, and I've seen it and all these other guys have too. We pull up and somebody's out with a chainsaw thinking they're helping us out by going ahead and getting that tree cut off our line for us. <coughs> the 
problem with that is we have a tree here. We're going to put it right here in the drive saw and see what happens. Because people think wood, hey, that's a great insulator. It's going to stop the electricity, right? stopping electricity. So we appreciate you guys or anybody that gets to a road with a tree on it and shut the road down for us. And a lot of times you guys stay there and that makes our life so much easier. But please, if the trees are on the power lines, just keep the road shut down, keep people back from it. When we get there, we'll cut them off. Because there's a, a chance that that tree could be laying there and there could be electricity on that tree on those lines that are down. We've seen it so many times. It may just, the tree may just be laying on the power lines, about bogging it down a little bit, may not even have it to the ground, and everything is still hot. It's staying in situation. Let's change gears here. I don't know how long the right here. Who thinks that's going to be a conductor? <laughs> I ask kids this all the time. Nobody really knows. So you don't, that's all right. Insulator? Of course, you guys are thinking, just push the button, buddy. Let's see what happens. <laughs> All right, let's see what happens. <laughs> you can, can you see right there at the end how the electricity kept jumping across there even after you pulled the balloon out? Once that arc was started, the moisture in the air was enough to keep that arc going. Now, there's actually a story about a model of the balloon and, um, who was it that done that? Was that Leon Leatherman? Do you remember that? The story is, my gentle man who tells it the truth, so I believe it. There was a gentleman who worked here years ago named Leon Leatherman. And his wife actually sent him some mylar balloons here at work. Well, Leon was kind of a man's man. He really didn't want these mylar balloons. So as he was going out the gate, he opened the door on his truck and let it go. And if you look out as you leave, you'll see a bunch of power lines that run down our driveway right there. And those mylar balloons went up into the power lines. I believe they knocked out electricity to all of Brownstown, didn't they? <laughs> all of Brownstown was out of electricity because Leon let them let these mylar balloons go. So, mylar balloons are very conductive. We see people doing, you see it on the news, you see it everywhere, people do these balloon launches. You know, they, somebody has passed or they have something, something they want to symbolize or remember. And so you see all these people letting all these mylar balloons go. It just kind of makes you cringe because you think, man, one of those model balloons hitting into our power line and cause an incredible amount of trouble. So, if you have a balloon launch, please don't get it in the power line. All right, we're going to talk about uh, vehicles because this is really something that's in you guys' wheelhouse here. You guys are the first people to get called out on uh, car wrecks. And. When we see car wrecks, a lot of times we see power lines down on the vehicles. This rubber tire, would that, be a, would that provide enough insulation for that electricity you think it would stay on the car? Or do you think that electricity would find its way through the tire? The truth of the matter is, I don't know. It just, it, there's a lot of variables there. Tires also have steel, steel belts in them. How much rubber is on it? What's the ground conditions like under it? How much current is on that electricity at that time? We're going to see what happens with this one right here. And Jerry goes to the voltage to the hot line on it. As you can see, electricity is going through that tire and going down to the ground. There have been instances people have been in vehicles, the power lines were actually on the vehicles, energizing the vehicles, and everything's good. The people inside the vehicle are okay, as far as not, not having electricity on them, I guess. They may be hurt, they may be injured, but as long as they stay in that vehicle, the electricity is not going to hurt them. They are isolated from the electricity that's going around them. They're not providing a path to ground. The problem comes up when somebody walks up and says, hey, come on, get out. Or somebody walks up and grabs the doorknob and says, let me get that for you. Let me open that for you. Come on out. And you've instantly created a path to the ground. Well, electricity finds that path. And you are that new path to the ground. 
So what we teach people, and what I teach the kids when we do this safety presentation to kids, is stay in the vehicle. Call 911, call an electric company, call somebody. Do not get out of that vehicle. Because if you're in this vehicle and there's power lines on it and you open the door and you step out, electricity's going to find its way through you. We had someone killed on our project, maybe Mark knows more of the details on it, years ago. He was digging with a, with a backhoe. He dug into one of our power lines. And his backhoe became energized. And he was on the backhoe and he was okay. Unfortunately, when he stepped off the backhoe, Tell people, get in the power line of your vehicle or your tractor or anything. Stay there. Stay where you want. Call us. And we'll come and make sure that the lines are getting adjusted. Now, also, there may be times where people have to get out of the vehicle if it's on fire or if there's a severe injury and they don't have any help on the way. And then, all of a sudden, what we teach the kids then is open the door and simply jump out, both feet at one time, and then continue to bunny hop away from the vehicle. Now that's the first case of area. That's the very last option, but it is an option. People say, why do you have to bunny hop away from a vehicle that has electricity on it? Because this electricity could be it's going into ground somewhere. And if the ground has a lot of moisture in it right here, but not a lot of moisture in here, then you've got more electricity here than you do here. And if I step between those two points, that electricity is going to go through me to even itself out. I've created a path for that electricity. So I tell the kids, bunny hop, jump, both feet at the same time until you're 30 or 40 yards away from the vehicle. Then you're safe. Then you can run away. Go help call out or whatever you want to do. So if you guys, again, first responders, you guys are some of the first people on the job. You pull up to a situation and there's, feet and there's power lines on the vehicle. Please don't, don't approach it. Don't grab it. Don't tell them to get out of it. Unless it's you know on fire, let us know and we'll, we'll be there. Which brings up another point about Gary getting there. We are not emergency vehicles, as much as we might like to think we are. We're really not. We don't have the same authority that you guys have when it comes to getting somewhere. You know, we drive these big lumber and bucket trucks. They're not emergency trucks. They're not designed to be driven like an emergency truck. It takes us a while to get to where you guys are. And I know it's frustrating for you guys. You know, we're on 2 o'clock in the morning, my phone rings, and I answer, I stumble out of bed, and they say there's a house fire down on Shores Corner Road, or down in Martinsburg, they want an ETA. Because you guys are there waiting on us. Well, my ETA, it takes me about 10 minutes to get woke up and get, get dressed, maybe 15 if I make a cup of coffee in my carrier to get woke up. It takes me another 10 or 15 minutes to drive into the office, we meet, there's two of us on call all the time. We both meet in here in the office. We get into our, our vehicle, and then we drive to wherever it is. It's generally going to be an hour before we get to where you guys are. And I hate that. And I know that's frustrating for you guys, because a lot of times you guys are standing there waiting on us. Where's these guys at? What's taking them so long? You know, trust me when I say we get there as quickly as we safely and legally can. But again, we don't have the authority to drive 80 of those people past people in double yellow lines and that sort of thing. So it just takes us a little bit longer to get there. Just be patient with us. We're trying to get there as quickly as we can. So, you're going to have some pot dogs loaded up here. And we're going to use those to um, sim simulate our fingers because we don't really want to use an actual person, obviously. Um, you know, the United States Department of Agriculture says that a hot dog can be no more than 10% water. Isn't that crazy? If you ever watch a documentary, you, you should Google making hot dogs on YouTube sometime. You'll never eat one again, I promise you. The things they put in the thing are, are it will make you never want one again. But they say no more than 10% water. Now, we know that water is what makes us such good electric conductors, right? Our bodies are 70% water or more, so we're about seven times better conductor to these hot dogs are. Well, we're going to use these hot dogs to demonstrate a human hand up here. Here we go here.
Because electricity is kind of like a microwave oven. It cooks from the inside out. Where you make contact with it, there may not be that big a hole. When electricity comes out, there may not be that big of a hole. But as it goes through, it cooks and it burns your muscles and your tendons and your blood vessels and your bones and the marrow in your bones. It causes incredible damage if it goes through. The problem with electricity is when you come into contact with a power line, it can cause your muscles to constrict. And you can't let go. Your mind is saying, let go of that. It's killing me. But your muscles won't. It's very dangerous to us. We had a gentleman come in several years ago, and he was missing both his arms. Remember him, George? What that guy's name was? Uh, it doesn't matter. I guess it's not relevant. But he came in and gave a safety presentation. He was a lineman, and he was up working on the power lines like this, and he grabbed a hold of both of these lines because he thought they were off. I think that's the story, wasn't it? He didn't have his rubber gloves on. He grabbed a hold of both of those lines, and electricity went in one arm. He was chest and out his other. He honestly survived, but he lost both his arms. He had a little fake arm with pinchers on him, didn't he? Eddie Black was his name. Eddie Black. Very powerful presentation. I'll never forget. That's been 20 something years ago. I'll never forget looking at that guy thinking, that could be me right there. If I don't fall through it. That could be me. It made a huge impact on him. So, how do Jerry and I work on power lines? And you see us, we don't de energize these lines when we work on them generally. Nobody wants their electric to be out for an extended period of time. So part of our job is to go up here and work on these power lines while there's still 7,000 volts of electricity going through them. So we obviously use rubber gloves. Now, we have a medical glove loaded up here on a piece of wire. It's made out of rubber. We're going to see what happens. I think he puts that thing through the middle finger just to spice it. Sometimes. I think he shows me what he thinks about me. He does that every time. Let's see what a medical grade glove does. Let's see if it provides any protection. No, it doesn't provide any protection at all, obviously. So, we have special gloves that we use. I've got one right here if anybody wants to look at it. Jerry's got one of those loaded up right here. We're going to give him a shot and see what happens. Here we go, Jerry. Here we go. Right. Got a hole in the finger? Got a hole in the finger. She does. We do that to prove, show you a point, and that every time before I go up and grab a hold of a power line with a rubber glove on it, we have a very stringent safety protocol that we do. We pull that glove apart and we inspect it very thoroughly. We inflate it with air and we listen for air leaks and we pull it and we stretch it and we look for any kind of hole. Because my life depends on that glove right there. My life depends on that glove not having any holes in it like that one right there had. And so it's our company policy. Any time before you go, go and you grab all the power line, you aren't sure better make sure you've inspected that glove and make sure it's good. He's got one right here that we've inspected already and we know it's good. Go ahead, Jerry. He can grab hold and rub that glove along that power line all day long. Nothing will happen to that. It's a good glove. So he's going to make some changes back here. And while he does that, I want to talk to you about some of these pieces of equipment right here. I'm going to be talking about this OCR, which stands for Oil Circuit Reclosure. Now, a lot of times you'll be home at night and your light will flash off for a second and then it'll come back on. <coughs> yeah, that's great, right? Yeah. Back on. The, the reason that they do that is because we have all these pieces of equipment here on the line somewhere. And what this piece of equipment does is it senses that there's something wrong with the line beyond that point. Say a tree is falling on the line. 
or a car has hit a pole, or a squirrel, or a bird, or something has got up there. What this piece of equipment does is it senses that problem, and it will de-energize the line for just a, a moment, a momentary de-energized line. It hopes that whatever the problem is, if it was a bird, if it was a tree limb, it will fall away in the clear, and then this piece of equipment re-energizes the line. That's great. Because I don't have to get out of bed and go turn the lights back on and turn the lights on. This piece of equipment will do that three times. If your lights flash off, and they come back on. This piece of equipment says, oh, there's still something wrong. There's still a tree limb on that line. Let's try it again. So it will go off for a second, and it will come back on. <clears throat> nope, still something on that line. It will do it again. It will go off. This time it will stay off for just a little bit longer. It tries to come back on again. If it still senses something is wrong on that line, it will, open, it will turn the lights off again and make it stay off. So if your lights are flashing off once or twice and they come back on, the reason for that is because this piece of equipment here is doing its job. It's doing what it was designed to do, and that is to get your lights back on and not bother me when I'm on call. So Jared's going to demonstrate that. Watch this light right here. And you can listen. You'll hear it. It'll come. Make noises in there. Here we go. Saw this little yellow handle right here fell open on the fourth try. And just tried four times to re-energize the line. Still something wrong. It says I'm done. You're gonna have to send somebody down here to fix the problem. That means me and Jerry are gonna have to get out of bed. We're gonna have to do that. Uh, probably the biggest problem. Uh, we have several things that cause problems with electricity and trees. Or one of our biggest issues that cause that tree limbs falling across the line. Birds are another big one. Squirrels, raccoons, I mean, any number of small animals. Uh, it's just, there, there's so many different things. You pull up and, and your mind begins, as you pull up, you, your mind begins to wonder, okay, I need to go check and see what's going on down here. And generally speaking, we will never try to re-energize the line without driving down that line and trying to see what caused that problem. Okay, so your lines are out and you see an REMC truck coming down the line. Everybody's, most of the time, everybody's out in the yard and they're waving. And so we pull up, well, what's going on? I'm a light shot. Okay, well, thank you. Next out. <laughs> hey, what's up? Yeah, my light shot. Okay. And so if you see it, if your lights are out and you see us driving down the road, it's because we're looking to try to figure out what it is. Now, if you have some insight into what happened, by all means, tell us. You know, hey, there's a tree laying down here behind my house on the power line. That's what's called it. Hey, there's a car wreck right down the road here. Yeah, absolutely. We appreciate all the input. It makes our life so much easier. But don't think just because that we drive by your house that you're not going to get your lights back on. We run into that lot, you know. We're driving down the road and sometimes people do this. What are you waiting on? What are you doing? My lights are out. Why are you going on by? The reason is we're trying to figure out what, what it is. We have, I had a line down down by West Washington School one time several years back. It was a nice clear day, not like today, there was really no reason it should have been out. So it came up, I started driving down the road, trying to figure out what was going on. About, uh, about a half mile down the road, some wire had fell down across the driveway. And there was an office gentleman, and he had that wire in his hand, he was rolling it up, getting out of his driveway. He had no idea if that wire was energized or de-energized, but he ran it. He just started rolling it up. He was out of the way, so he was the horses. I stopped and said, what are you doing, partner? He said, I'm getting this wire out of the way. Well, I wish you wouldn't touch that wire. How would you know it wasn't energized? It's laying on the ground. That's not good enough. You know, we're, we're, very particular, we're very careful about re-energizing the line. You know, we're going to do our due diligence to make sure that we try to figure out what happened before we do that. Now, talk about this thing here. It wants to turn electricity back on. It will do that three times, and the fourth time it will leave it off. And we have another piece of equipment called a fuse right here. And this piece of equipment is a one and done. If a bird or a tree limb or something gets on the line beyond one of these, you're going to hear what some people refer to as a gunshot. Anybody ever heard that? 
We get we hear that a lot. People call us and say, it sounded like a gun went off down by my road. Now my electric's out. I know what that is. But we're going to demonstrate one for you right here, Jerry Rams, with this little squirrel. All right, Jerry, kill the squirrel. You still jumped, didn't you? <laughs> Somebody did not Well, that's what these, these, uh, these fuses here do. They actually do have gunpowder loaded in them. And that's what gives you the noise. That's what gives you enough energy to open that up and get the guys in So when people call us and they say, my lights are off and heard a gunshot. That's what's happening. That gunpowder inside that fuse is causing it to open up and be in guys a lot. If you hear it bang and the lights go out, that means somebody's going to have to come down and get your lights turned up. Right <coughs> ah, I think we went through about everything we have here. You guys have any questions for me? For Jerry? People always ask me if you've ever been shot before. That's what the kids always ask me. And I hate to admit it with my boss sitting here, but I have been shot before. Um, and, and the reason is because I wasn't following the proper safety rules. I didn't have my gloves on once. I was working down inside the transformer. I got my finger somewhere where it shouldn't have been. It hurts like a devil. It really does. Luckily, I've not been severely injured to that. Um, people ask me, what's the weirdest thing that's ever caused a line to go out? Um, we see all kinds of odd things. You know, a fish, I saw a fish up on top of the transformer once, obviously a bird was up there and it took off and dropped it somewhere where it shouldn't. You guys have any questions for me or for anybody else? Yes, sir. Well, I have a thing here that's up there in the weather, it's laying a lot. You have some of your nuts and bolts on your nuts and bolts on your nuts and get loose and then uh, I'll just spark an arc sound sometimes. Uh, the hardware being loose wouldn't cause a spark or a heart. 